Hey guys, so last time we talked about dealing with hypothesis tests with large samples. So now we're going to move on to small samples. So let's go ahead and get started with our concept. So, small sample test statistic for the mean. So back when we talked about sampling distributions, and a lot of this is kind of like a repeat, but just with small samples, so just bear with it. Um, we had to calculate Z and T statistics. And remember, the Z is when you had samples that were larger than 30, right? Otherwise, you use a t-calculation. And technically, I, I mentioned this before, but the reason that this happens is that when you have a sample size that's larger than 30, the sample standard deviation basically estimates, so n is greater than or equal to 30, that sample standard deviation is essentially estimating the population standard deviation. But when it's smaller than that, the, sam the sample standard deviation may be a little off or biased in a certain way. So that's why we have to use the t-distribution. So for samples that are small, aka n is less than 30, right? Uh, the test statistic is calculated um, using the following formula. And it should really look familiar. It should look exactly the same as what we did with the z-distribution, right? And so kind of up here, I have the breakdown null and alternate HO and HA. The z-critical to t-critical, um, just put zc and tc. Z or T's test statistics are just Z and T, and then alpha is the significance level that's going to be given for every hypothesis test. So T is X bar minus the mean, so how far is the sample mean from the population mean, divided by the standard error of our sample mean, right? So our mu naught or mu zero comes from the null hypothesis, right? It's kind of just saying our null says this is what it should be. Let's see how far my sample mean is from that number. The standard error is standard error just like we calculated before, but just dealing with a sample mean this time. That's not a good estimator of the population mean, right? If it was, it's because we had sample size greater than 30 and we use Z. Then we have X bar sample mean, SX bar standard error, and N is sample size. So a lot of this is kind of like a recap, not anything new. Um, the only thing that really changes is the critical value. So remember back in the day, critical value, how did we get the T? So to get the T, the critical. Well, actually, let's go ahead and do the problem, and then we'll figure it out then. And we have like, a lot of practice problems as well to kind of rehash all that stuff. But if you need a review, we talked about it in the critical value and rejection regions video. So now that you have the rejection region, again, going back to that video, so you saw that one, now we're here. Um, you know where the test statistic you calculate must lie. In order for you to say that you finding a sample as extreme as you did, is not likely due to chance. So this sample is so far off that it's not likely that, you know, oh, maybe it was a little below, maybe it was a little above, and that just happens naturally. Yeah, that's true, but at a certain point, it's not that natural, right? So after you get to this critical value and you pass it, it's like, oh, it's not really likely that that should have happened if I got a sample this size. And then we reject the null hypothesis or the status quo. So. Let's do an example. So some researchers think there's reason to believe that within the United States, so this is very similar to the last one, I just changed the sample size. Um, the average sexual activity has increased since 2000. In 2000, people were having sex four times a week on average. You collect a random sample of 16 Americans and find a mean standard deviation of 5.2 and 8 per week. Conduct a hypothesis test using an alpha of 0.05. So let's do this. So step one, let's go ahead and get our null and alternate, right? So what is the claim? What are we trying to figure out? We're trying to see if activity has increased since 2000, right? So it's greater than what it was in 2000, right? So greater than falls on my alternate, right? Has increased, aka greater than. So that goes mu is greater than. And how much was it in 2000? It was 4, right? So greater than 4. If my alternate is greater than, my null has to be kind of like everything else, right? So if it's greater than 4, everything else is less than or equal to 4. Cool. So now when we have greater than, what does that tell us about our test? Is it a left, right, or two tail? It's a right test, right? Oh, I'm going to write rest. <laughs> So it's a right tail test. So that means we're focusing on everything to the right side, right? So it has to be really extreme on the high end for us to reject the null hypothesis. What's the area of that little tail there? 
And this is all pretty much review, nothing has changed. So hopefully this is kind of pretty easy. That tail area is 0 0.05, right? That's going to be our rejection region. And it's our middle point, and that's basically it, right? So our next step is to get that rejection region. So we need a T critical that is based off of two pieces of information. So one of them is alpha, right? And do we have to do anything to that alpha in this case? No, because we're not doing a two tail. So it's the full alpha because our T table works off of this area here, right? From the number all the way up. So all we need is the alpha, which in this case is 0 0.05. And degrees of freedom is just like we saw before, right? It's n minus one. So degrees of freedom of n minus one, that's 16 minus one, or 15. And we get a t critical of, let's go ahead and scroll down to our table. So we have 0 0.05 degrees of freedom of 15. Boom, boom. 1.753, does that make sense? So you just literally go to degrees of freedom, which is n minus one, and the alpha, if it's a one tail. If it's two tail, you go to alpha over two, and that's what I specify here, right? So alpha or alpha over two, and that's a choice that you make, that you need to understand based off of what your null, what your alternate says. That it was pointing to the left, pointing to the right, not equal to, and then you make your decision from there. So 1.753 is our critical value. That means our cutoff here is 1.753 and everything above that, whoops, everything above that, we're gonna be rejecting the null hypothesis, right? So our next step is, let's get our test statistic. And remember, the critical value kinda of says, here's the cutoff. Your test statistic is your sample, I guess, basically the, the easiest way to put it is, the critical value tells you how many standard deviations away from the mean that you can be and still be okay. Outside of that, we reject the null hypothesis. Our test statistic is how many standard deviations away our sample is from the null hypothesis, right? So how far is it from the status quo or what we thought it should be? If it's too far, then we have to reject it. And that's why we come up with that last conclusion at the end. So T is X bar minus the mu from the null hypothesis over standard error of the mean. So standard error is S over square root of N. And in this case, our standard deviation is 5.2 over the square root of our sample size in this case is 4, right? So, well I'm sorry, it's 8 over square root of 4. 8 over square root of 16. Jesus, take the wheel. So 8 over square root of 16, so that's 8 over 4 or 2, right? And then, from there, we have x bar minus the mean over the standard deviation. So x bar minus the mean, so we have 5.2, minus the mean from the null hypothesis, right? So our null says that it should have been 4. Let's go ahead and highlight that real quick. Over 2. So 5.2 over 4 is 1.2. 1.2 divided by 2 is 0.6. Cool. So our t is 0.6, and now we need a final conclusion. We debase that conclusion off of where does our test statistic lie in this kind of my rejection region versus everything else, or I guess if you want to call it the non-rejection region. So we have 0.6, and that lies over here, right? Let's do 0.60. So are we in the rejection region or not in the rejection region? So we're not in the rejection region, AKA we fail to reject HO. Does that make sense? So there isn't enough evidence for, or I guess the longer way to put this, um, for those of you who have to write the longer way, and we'll have a video to kind of go over how to write these things, the final conclusions. Um, but it's basically saying that we don't have, we have insufficient evidence to support the alternate hypothesis, which was a claim that on average, uh, people are having more sex now than they were having in 2000. 
that's basically the long way to put it, but moral of the story is that our test statistic wasn't in the rejection region, so we can't reject it or we fail to reject the null hypothesis because our sample wasn't too far off for us to say that for sure the null is wrong, right? So that's about it for uh, test statistics for the small samples. So let's go ahead and move on to our practice problems and see if uh, we're doing pretty well.